so uh, we were <clears throat> um, all right. Let me start over then. Hi everyone. Um, so for this um, for today's uh, meeting, we were thinking that we will take um, a bit of a broader perspective on sharing research outputs, and then provide some uh, specific examples in the guidelines and tips about a few types of research outputs, as well as highlight two services that we have at the Silab Lab Data Center. Um, so first, I want to very briefly mention, kind of define open science and FAIR a little bit. That is something that has, I'm sure you've already heard about a lot, because this is something that uh, we talk about every time. Um, but uh, so I'm not going to go into detail about any of them. They are, you know, defining them is by itself a big topic. But um, just wanted to say briefly, like, so fair principles are, um, this is a set of principles that was designed to improve the infrastructure supporting reuse of research data. And they fair refers to findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reuse of digital assets. And each of these has its own definition, has its own criteria. Um, and then another concept that I want to quickly define is open science. So when we talk about open science, we typically talk about a um, set of movements and practices that all together, like, or the shared thing between them is that they have the uh, goal to make as much of research and knowledge generated by research openly available to everyone, to uh, increase collaborations, increase sharing, reproducibility, and so on. So, and here I'm referring to a UNESCO definition of uh, open science. So the services that we work on at the Data, Lab Data Center, they are all around fair and open science. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the specific things in, in a few slides. Um, so as I said, we're going to take a bit of a broader perspective first about um, sharing research outputs. So we are quite used to hearing about FAIR and open science in the context of sharing data. That has been uh, quite, uh, that's been a big topic of debate or discussions, and there were lots of recommendations over the past couple of years, which is amazing. But actually, when we think about FAIR and open science, uh, we don't just think about data. We think about any type of research output, and data is just one of them. Um, so, for example, um, uh, we can talk about the communication of the research result, and this will be a research article. It can be a presentation. It can be a blog post. Any way in which you communicate your results um, it can be a poster and so on. And as I said, we talk about data, but then we also talk, for example, about analysis code. We talk about pipeline workflow that was created as part of this research project. Uh, we can talk about computational models that have been produced. We can talk about different tools, and tools here refers to um, quite often, more often than you know, people realize uh, when researchers are carrying out a research project, when they're doing some sort of analysis, they made in a script, for example, that can be used by others, and then they turn it into a tool. Maybe they turn it into a package, or maybe they turn it into a tool with a graphical user interface. And there are lots more research outputs. We can talk about data management plans. We can talk about lab notebooks, ethical review, grant proposals, peer review, and so on. All of these are you know, considered research outputs that we should be thinking about in terms of fair and open science. And the default is that all of this should be made openly available, actually. Um, and there should be a really good reason not to make some of this openly available. Now, this is not yet common practice, but this is also kind of our job to push this a bit more and get people thinking about this like that. Um, so today we're going to um, highlight some of these. And there are some shared principles between sharing research outputs, all of these research outputs. So one principle is that when you do share them, they should all be interlinked. So when you share data, it should be clear when, where there is code for this data. If you're sharing a load, lab notebook, it should be clear where there is data and code for that and so on. So all of these different research outputs should be interlinked. But also each of them has to fulfill, well, certain criteria in order to meet FAIR as much as possible, in order to adhere to open science practices as much as possible. Um, so here I'm going to just 
tell you about a few basic principles that I want to highlight. And I think that, you know, when you share research output, if it meets these um, requirements or criteria, you will, you will already go a long way and they can always improve from there. So one thing that is important when you're sharing a, any type of research output is that they, it should have a globally unique persistent identifier. And typically we talk about this, uh, about DOIs, for example. So DOIs uh, is a digital object identifier, but there are many other types of uh, persistent identifiers. And this will depend on the type of research output on uh, the repository or where you are sharing it. But the important thing is that each of these should have a globally unique persistent identifier. Another important principle is that they should be versioned. So if you're sharing a code and if you keep working on this code, you should always be clear demarcation case version one is version two, version three. And when you are referring to this code, it should be clear which version of the code you're referring to. Um, another principle is that when you share an output, it should be in some sort of uh, community, well, best if it's community created, community agreed standard format, so that others can easily open the files that you're sharing, so that others you can easily work with these files. And this is important, for example, let's say if you're working with some proprietary software and not everyone can afford to buy this software, so you should try to share it in a format that will work with an open source software. Another principle is that whatever you share should be described with metadata and it's even better if it's community created or community accepted metadata and by metadata we mean description of your data and every research field, every type of data will have different descriptions that are different uh, aspects that are important, so different type of description that is required. So um, whenever you share any type of research output, you should think about what's appropriate to describe what would your colleagues expect. Um, another principle is that whenever you share research output, there should be a clear license attached to it. So what, without the license, basically no one can reuse that because then we don't know what is allowed and what is not allowed. So whenever you share any type of research output, you should think about what license is appropriate for it and, uh, and share it together with this license. Um, and uh, should be uh, research output should be shared where community will find it. So what I mean by that is that uh, you already know probably where you would go looking for similar type of research output. Let's say if you're sharing data, you would know what reposit data repository you would typically go to to find this type of data. And uh, if you're sharing code, you know where your community is sharing code typically. And um, so if possible, you should go to this place. And if there is no such place, then you can go to a general repository. And Anna will talk about it um, in the second half of this uh, webinar today. Um, another aspect here is that uh, you might there might be a place where the community goes, and there might be another place which actually fulfills uh, fair principles to some extent. So then you should be sharing it in both places and referring to uh, the a uh, place where the community will find it because you know it's no use sharing things if no one can find it so uh, you should always share it where the community can find it and then you can always have kind of a reference to that from another place which let's say gives a, a unique persistent identifier um it's important that different components that you share work with each other so when you are sharing code you should make sure that this code can be run on the data that you shared for this project um and another principle the last one that i put here is that whatever you share it you should make sure that there is some sort of commitment to long-term availability and archiving uh, so that you know that it will not be lost um all right so these were kind of these were some things that i picked there are many other things to think about but as i said if you think about these things you will already go a long way um so at Silo Club Data Center, our mission is to kind of create services to allow sharing of a wide range of research outputs. Um, and we re recommend that you start thinking about what you're gonna share and where early on. 
In this presentation, we will cover some types of outputs. So we'll cover data, research results, we'll co cover code, tools, and computational models. Um, and we will also highlight two services. So one will be Scilab data repository and the other one will be Scilab Lab Um There are other services that we have. And in order to find information about them, I just want to mention here that you can go to data.scilablab.ac where you can find other services that either we at the Scilab Lab Data Center or someone else in Sweden is developing for life sciences. Um, all right, that's it for the first part. So now I'm going to um, allow Anna talk about Scilab Lab Data Repository. Thank you. Let me share my screen. There, can you see my screen well? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Um, so yeah, my name is Anna and I also work at the Scilab Lab Data Center. And today I will present the Scilab Lab Data Repository. Um, so the Scilab Lab Data Repository is a web-based system for publishing both data and other types of research output, as Arnold mentioned just before. And it's important to note that this is not a service uh, to be used for storing. Uh, rather, it's a service to use for uh, publishing. And it's open to use by researchers at Swedish academic institutions that are working within uh, life science. And this repository is an institutional instance of a general repository called Figshare. And institutional in this meaning refers to Scilife Lab. And Figshare is a, a general data repository, uh, which means that uh, they accept uh, research outputs uh, regardless of the discipline or domain. So at one point or another, uh, you might find yourself wondering, should I always publish in the Scilab Lab data repository? And the short answer is no. And for the long answer, I've used this uh, diagram um, for support. <laughs> um, so um, it is important to take a step back when you're selecting a repository for your research output. And first of all, you can uh, consider whether your files contain sensitive information or not. And if the answer is no, then you uh, should consider whether there are uh, domain specific repositories for this uh, specific case um, of yours. But if the answer is still no, that is when you might find yourself in a situation where the Scilab Lab data repository could be a good um, repository for you to use. So once you find yourself in that situation and you want to uh, publish uh, some research output in the repository, uh, you can log in using your normal university credentials. And it's the first time that you uh, log in that an, an uh, account is uh, automatically created for you. And before you uh, submit anything to the repository, we always recommend you to read through the submission guidelines because you will find a lot of useful information there. And it's also important to remember that this is a curated repository. So that means that everything that you uh, submit to the repository for publication will be reviewed. And uh, this uh, review uh, will be done by one of the Scilab Lab data repository team members.
and you can publish several different item types in the repository. Uh, for example, data management plans, data sets, educational resources, presentations, and workflows. Um, but you can see in the figure here to the right that the vast majority of what has been published in the repository is data sets. Um, but it is being used for other research outputs as well, as you can see here in the list. Excuse me, Anna, was that image representing the megabytes or the numbers? Ah, oh, sorry. Um, it's uh, the number of uh, items. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, so this is, yeah, 176 items that have been published are of type data set. And a very small number telling how we did it. <laughs> Workflow. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and there are different publishing options for the repository. And these options can be grouped into uh, just two uh, scenarios. And the first scenario being that you want to publish an item with the actual files. And the second scenario being that you want to publish an item without any files. And to understand which publishing option that is relevant for your specific case, uh, you can follow the questions in this diagram. Um, so firstly, um, you will need to answer if the files contain any sensitive information or not. And depending on the answer on that question, uh, you might also need to think about whether the files will be published for the first time or not. So uh, the first publishing option is to publish the files openly. And this is an example of what an item like that looks like. Um, so here you can see the files listed and that they're um, open for download by anyone with this uh, link or finding this item. The second publishing option is to use uh, embargo or restricted access. And this is a more broad option, including uh, uh, some uh, several decisions that you need to take. So chosen to show a few examples. And this is an example of an item where the submitter has said set a specific time period for the embargo. And we currently didn't have any item like this on the Silof Lab data repository. Uh, so that's why I've used this uh, example from another institutional fixture instance. And this one belongs to the University of Southeastern Norway. Um, but you can see here clearly stated how long uh, how long time remains until the files are av openly available. Another example of uh, embargo and restricted access is where you can choose if it should be possible to request access to the embargoed files. And if you choose that, then you will have this button on your item um, and anyone clicking here will be uh, presented with more information on how to proceed. The third uh, publishing option is to publish uh, metadata about files that are already published elsewhere.
And for that item, you can see uh, that it's clearly stated here that the files are stored elsewhere. And you also uh, get the link to where the files are. Uh, have been published. And lastly, uh, we have the option of publishing a metadata record. And this option is uh, relevant where when your files uh, do contain uh, sensitive information, so you cannot uh, publish the files within the system. And a metadata record looks like this. Um, so you have the text uh, stating that the files are not publicly available. And you can see that the submitter has also included a reason for this. And for this scenario, uh, if the files will be shared, they will be shared uh, through uh, direct communication outside of the Scilab Lab data repository. Um, yeah, yeah um, so that was just a very quick uh, overview of the different uh, publishing options that the Scilab Lab data repository offers. So, you are more than welcome to uh, contact any of us in the Scilab Lab data repository team. You can always send us an email at fixture at scilablab.se. And thank you for listening. I will hand the floor back to you, Arnold. Yes, thank you, Anna. So now that we learned about Scilab Lab data repository, I'm going to talk a little bit about sharing code, tools, and machine learning models. And I'm going to talk a little bit about another service that we have, which is Scilab Lab Surf. Uh, but before that, I wanted to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about sharing code. Um, that is something that's not talked about a lot. And so something where we can all learn more, I think. Um, so when we talk about sharing code, we talk about sharing all sorts of things. It can be a short analysis script. It can be a workflow. It can be a pipeline consisting of many large steps. Um, but importantly, there is no piece of code that is too small to share. There is something that uh, we hear uh, sometimes. Researchers think that because the, the script does very simple things, so because it's very short, it's not something that's worth sharing. That is really not true. I mean, anything that is published as a research result or some result from your uh, work should be always uh, supported by a piece of code which you used in order to arrive at that conclusion. Um, and the way to share code is, uh, well, you can just share it as script files. That's already great. That's, uh, but it's even better if you can share it as a notebook or a report. So if you have Python code, for example, Jupyter Notebook would be a good format. If you have R code, an R Notebook would be a good format. Notebooks like this allow to uh, describe the code in uh, as well as have the code in the same place and allow users to run the code if they want to and modify it in the same place. Um, it's important to share not just the code, but also the environment. So um, sometimes we see that people do not share what the packages were in the environment when the code was run and what versions were there. Um, an easy way to solve this is to use um, a dedicated tool for that. For example, if you have R, if you're using R, then there is RN, which is which will allow you to export all the all the packages that you have in your environment currently with all the versions, and it will also allow you to restore the same environment somewhere else. You can use, if you have Python code, for example, you could have your packages and the exact version in the requirements, txt file. An even better approach would be to create a Docker image where all the dependencies are in place, including the operating system, but that is a bit advanced, so we don't have to talk about it here. Um, it's important that when you share code together with the data that you shared, 
you should arrive at the exact number that you gave in your paper or in your conference or in your blog post. Um, and even if you are not allowed to share data, you should still be sharing code that you wrote. Um, sometimes there are very good reasons not to share data. Um, maybe the data is sensitive, um, but the code that was written during the research project can always be shared. And best practice around that is actually to create a fake data set where you will have exactly the same columns or and exactly the same format, but just some fake data. This way, there is no issue with privacy or sensitivity of the data, but you will the people who will find your code will see that it how it ran with the with the data set that you had. Um, an even better practice would be to create uh, synthetic data based on your real data. And synthetic data can show the overall structure of the patterns, but that's also a rather advanced topic and there is still debate around that. So that is not necessary, but at least some fake data set with random numbers is great. Um, yeah, and this is what the notebooks look like. If you haven't seen one, uh, Jupyter notebooks looks and what the R notebook looks like. Um, so where do, we, where do we share code? So GitHub, for example, is a huge service, which is really popular and a lot of people use it. It's quite easy. So it's good to share your code in GitHub if that's where your community is, uh, but it is not sufficient actually for FAIR. And that is because GitHub is not an archival repository and it does not provide a persistent identifier. As I said uh, in the first part of this webinar, um, sometimes there are cases where the community will want to find what your research output in one place, but uh, best practice according to fair and open science will be to put it somewhere else. And that's exactly this case where you should just refer to them, uh, refer to the other place. So the what you should be doing is um, still sharing code on GitHub, but then depositing a copy to a repository that will provide a persistent identifier and fulfill the archival requirement and so on. And there are easy ways to do that. So one way is to put it, this into a Scilab data repository, which Anna just presented. Another way is to put it on Zenodo, which is another alternative. And just because I didn't want this all to be about our services. I just wanted to give an example from Zenodo, and but uh, Scilab Lab data repository will work in exactly the same way. So you can connect your Zenodo account with a specific repository in which your code is, and actually Zenodo can then automatically pick up the uh, releases from your GitHub repository, and it will then give each release a new version and generate a new DOI and so on. This is a very convenient way to work with code. Um, and when you are referring to your code from the paper, then you will be using the DOI. So you will be using the Zenodo version or the style of data repository version. Um, and this way, we know that this record will always be available. A copy of your code will always be available. But if people want to, they can always go to GitHub and look at it live. But this also fulfills, you know, for example, versioning requirement, because this way, when you are referred to your code, uh, you know ex which exact version it was, even if you make changes in the future after your paper has been published, for example. Um, sharing tools. It's not something I'm going to talk about in detail. I just want to mention here that when you make a, a research tool, uh, there are also you fair and open science principles are also something that need to be considered and there are actually there are efforts to uh, define a set of principles that will be specific for sharing a research software um, I'm just going to you know say that they exist and we'll take a look at them but we're not going to go into detail here um, now when it comes to sharing machine learning models um, uh, a lot of research in life sciences now is data-driven, and a lot of it uh, will be using computational models. In this case, we'll talk about machine learning models. Um, what should be shared in that case? So there are different components that should be shared for 
uh, it to be useful. So you always need to share a training data set as data. So it means that you put it in a data repository. You need to share code that you've used, pre-processing code uh, or training scripts as code. So treat it as code. And resulting models should also be shared in a way that will allow uh, others to build on them. Uh, or another, uh, well, if, if, if it's deemed useful in that particular case, you can even share your models in a way that will uh, allow users to, to, to use them for inferences. So this means that, that other people can use your, your model to make new predictions. And you can do this as a script. Like, so you write the script, which will use your model to um, make an inference and put it in the same place where you have the model. Um, and provide a good description of how this should be used, or you can make a Docker image where all of this is included. Um, there is no single standard yet for describing models. That's because they are very different for different research fields, and that's because the uh, this area is moving really fast. Um, there are some examples of things you can share, or like there are some different attempts where you can which you can use for inspiration. Here I have an example um, from uh, Hugging Face, and this is different metadata fields that they suggest to include about models. So for example, you know, who developed it, who funded it, a type of this, what language it is, license, and so on. So I'm not going to go into detail here. I'm just going to say that these things exist. So when you are sharing a model, you should be thinking about this and looking around and just find the way that works best for you. It's, um, you might also want to make your model available um, somewhere with a URL so that either people can send um, API requests to it to make an, a refer an inference, or um, maybe you want to create the graphical interface for your model. And this can be useful as an additional material for publications. If you want the readers of your research article or blog post or whatever um, to explore your model more, uh, this can um, also be used as a prototype of some maybe future service which you're imagining based that can be built based on your model. Um, and this is something that we um, support at Scilab Lab Serve then. So what is Scilab Lab Serve? Scilab Lab Serve is a um, service developed by Scilab Lab Data Center, which allows hosting machine learning models and data science applications. This is a service that is still in uh, development. So there are many things that are already in place, but there are also many things that we are currently developing. So it allows to serve machine learning models in order to get an API rep endpoint for inference. So then the model is hosted on the hardware of the Scilab Lab Data Center and uh, requests can be sent to an API endpoint. Um, and another service that we offer is data science application hosting. So this can be applications that are built on um, top of machine learning models. So for example, you know, you can build a user interface for a model. And there are some dedicated frameworks for that, for example, Gradio and Streamlit, which are gaining uh, popularity. Uh, but it can also be applications that are not based on machine learning models, but are just uh, showing uh, different visualizations, uh, making other different types of analysis and so on. And these are typically built using Shiny in Shiny framework in R or maybe Dash framework with Python. Um, so this can also be uh, shared through Scilab Lab Serve. And this, as I said, this service that is still in development. And the idea that we have for this is that when you come and share your model or when you come and share your application with us, um, you will fulfill to a large extent fair requirements. But um, yeah, but it's still in development. But it is already open for everyone to come and try it out or use it already. Um, 
it's available free of charge to all life science researchers affiliated with the research institution or the international collaborators. It's the same as for the Silef Lab data repository that Anna described. Um, these are some specifics that we allocate some hardware resources to each app and model. Um, we do not allow any sensitive data to be hosted here. Um, and we expect all public all models and applications shared through Silef Lab Serve to become public eventually. They can be kept private during the uh, development process uh, or for a short period of time, similar to how Anna described embargo, but eventually everything is expected to become public. And we have a dedicated team that offer consultations, support and training. So when you have a model or when you have an app and you wanna share it and you don't know what how to approach this, we can help you. That's it for me, thank you. And I'm guessing we're going to Q&A.